welcome to Forbidden Planet 42, celebrating 42 glorious years of the Forbidden Planet retail chain here in London and, and trying to answer the, the, that ultimate answer to the question, life, the universe and everything. And in order to do that, I am here with a British living legend of the international fantasy industry. It's uh, one of the greatest, uh, one of the greatest authors the UK has ever produced, Mr. Michael Moorcock. And, the, and, and there's some nice magical music kicking off as yes, well. Yes, I know. I think it's the phone, actually. It's mine. Um, Hang on. I'm just trying to ruin the complete things here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was amazing. That was great. I couldn't have actually scripted that any better of a oh, try. Right. Well, uh, well, I'll tell you. Know, Sean, Sean plays the fiddle on our record. He's the guy who's just phoning. And uh, he's, he's got a perfect sense of timing. <laughs> Fantastic. Ever, ever the musician. Um, Michael, thanks so so much for joining us for this uh, special event, and uh, it, it's very much appreciated that you could shake out the time to speak to me. Oh, I'm glad to do it. Um, particularly in lockdown, I mean, I'm always, always ready for a break in the uh, in the TV programming. Ah, uh, yeah. I mean, in my work schedule. <laughs> oh, of course, yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> so, so, let me ask you: um, When did you be first become aware of Forbidden Planet? What was your what was your first interaction with us? Well, at first, um, it, I, I, I became aware of it pretty, um, pretty, pretty much immediately, I think. And um, this is back in seventy-eight. You know, yes, yeah. There, there was there was a tendency um, to to go to shops that were selling science fiction and fantasy specifically in order, you know, to keep them. To keep them going, but generally speaking, they didn't. I mean, the the um, the, the the general um, uh, view was, you know, okay, mate, you're you're enthusiastic, you know, you've got your you've got everything worked out, you know, you got your you got your books coming in, you got your you know, you got your money coming in, all the rest of it, and uh, you know, good luck to you. But you really felt that somehow they weren't going to do it, you know, and, because that was the nature of things. Um, even you know, Bram Stokes was the was the big starter of, of bookshops and, and uh, science fiction bookshops, and uh, you know, he wound up in jail. And that wasn't quite <laughs> so easy. He wound up in jail, <laughs> and uh, so I mean, there was a tendency you know, to, for that to happen anyway. Um, and so you thought that probably Forbidden Planet would be the same. I mean, there wasn't any reason not to think that. The same yeah. thing had happened in Los Angeles as well, you know. Um, and uh, so. Uh, you, you you know you hope for the best you hope to gather a year or two you know good year or two and i like i like the guys doing it um you know at the time nick and mike basically you know yeah. and uh, so i was i was all for it um but not expecting it to last <laughs> but somehow and i think it's thanks to nick i mean i must say um because he's got a steady hand on the tiller you know yeah. um, and i think it's that steady hand that natural steady hand that he has that 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 kept things going. I mean, he yeah. didn't, you know, he didn't over, he didn't go over the top to begin with. He didn't, you know, I mean, he he kept going properly and as it as, and his ambitions grew as his as his power grew. I mean, yeah. you know, if you call it power, whatever you like. Well, I, I think I think Nick something. would definitely like to refer to it as power. So I think that's the <laughs> word we'll use. All right, we'll use power then. <laughs> So after a while, after he'd taken over the, this entire planet, he went on to Mars, <laughs> which is not, not, not quite as good as he hoped it would be, because the Martians are a little bit, you know, they've had so much of science. A bit difficult, yeah. Tell <laughs> <laughs> so um, so he's, he's got this planet, you know, I think he ought to be great. It's just so true, one, so true. At least, you know, at least until... Um, <laughs> well, I'll, I'll, I'll show you quickly the the great Nick Landau um, power gesture, uh, power not power, just power gesture, is uh, is the is the glasses push. So you're in an, ever in a meeting with Nick Landau, one of our two fearless leaders with uh, Vivian Chung, and he does this. Hmm. <laughs> hmm. That means he's very interested in the opportunity you're presenting to him. If the glasses stay there, okay, you're not getting very far. But he goes, <laughs> hmm. That Put means... you the focus. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the way yeah, it works. That's, uh, yeah, right. I mean, uh, I, any, if, 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 however it works. I mean, it's it's been a really, really interesting. I mean, I've uh, 
um, you know, I, I knew a manager of Forbidden Planet who actually screwed uh, Nick and Mike at that time over. But Nick really, really handled that so well. And I was so impressed by Nick and how he, you know, how he managed a situation like that, which yeah. is a serious situation, particularly, you know, if you're in the retail of trade. Of course, yeah. And, uh, and he really, really, you know, he understood. He didn't get vengeful on on you know i mean he had to give back what he'd pinched yeah um if he had it you know whatever he had but he really didn't didn't do anything else and i think he was sad to fire fire this bloke because i mean he's dead now the guy i mean he was he was going to be dead if you like yeah got but it. he was so he was so good at, at doing things you know so helpful and useful that i mean he got he had other jobs in retail after that but you know people left him in charge of, of shops yeah um, and he probably pinched as much from them as he pinched from Forbidden <laughs> But um, <laughs> I don't think, I mean, he did, did need help, but he never got it. Yeah. Or at least he had it for about a week. And uh, so, you know, that's, that, that was just, just that really is, is my, my, my strong impression of Nick. You know, my, my, the, I saw him in action, as it were. Um, so, yeah, and I could then, I could also understand how the, how the, the chain built i mean it uh, from you know it was i think it was probably building then but i mean it wasn't as big as it is now yeah no um, I, and and can you remember um when you did your first signings at, at the forbidden planet store and how they were well yeah i mean they, they used to go around the block it was, yeah. a, it was a fairly small block um, <laughs> <laughs> um yeah i mean they, they were great days i love i love those signings actually yeah. um probably my favorite signings of all um missed them in a way i mean still do i haven't you know i've done one for a while yeah sorry i'm not crying out of sentiment <laughs> i mean not, i don't i, am <laughs> I thought you just said the magic people. words nick lando and you start then you started well <laughs> enough <laughs> yeah 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 I've, we I've, the, the problems with texas is allergies and i'm of course i'm, right. I'm just swimming in allergies oh, yeah. i never yeah. knew i had them before but here i am so yeah. anyway apologies oh mate I, I i would be the same i would be allergy i have been stricken with allergies when i've been in texas so i feel yeah. for you michael yeah. so um <laughs> so um I, I mean i think it's great that you have that the relationship with forbidden plant you've got on the emotional relationship with with what uh what with what vivian nick have achieved let me uh let, so if you don't mind uh, I, I would say that arguably the things that you're best known for are uh, elric and jerry cornelius and your your musical career at the same time could you um could you just get into a bit of uh, the the genesis of elric and and how how that amazing character came about and where well, it came yeah, from in I your mean, mind it was, uh, it was almost accidental i'd um I'd written a, a Conan story for Fantastic Universe, at least part of a Conan story, to see yeah. if it was going to run. Um, the editor of Fantastic Universe, an extremely irritating but nice man called, called Hans Stefan Santerson, who had been born in America but somehow spoke with an exaggerated Swedish accent. But wow. there you go. <laughs> um, and uh, he, 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 he and Spray de Camp wanted. Conan stories, new Conan stories. Spray de Camp was at that time in charge of the, of the Howard estate. And uh, so they asked me for one and I started one. Then Fantastic Universe collapsed as they were all doing at that time. This is the time when all the magazines were getting to go down pretty much, you know, like a house of cards. And only the, you know, very few of them survived that. Um, and even today, there's only one or two that are still with us. Um, and uh, so, I, you know, I, mean, I was used to that anyway, so I sort of just put it aside and forgot it. Anyway, I was working for Fleetway at the time, okay. which, of course, at that time was the big major Charles comics Charles publisher, etc., etc. Cetera, et cetera, so, 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 Mike, can I ask you what, uh, what um, I used to work at Fleetway also, by the way. And uh, oh. <laughs> I, 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 so uh, I used to work, I used to be a publisher for IPC. So um, which, uh, which, which properties did you work on when you were at Fleetway? Oh, Sexton Blake, um, which is the you know the the famous one, and uh, I also worked on the on the libraries sometimes. I mean, we we had a we had a system where people were assigned to a magazine, but we worked as a group. So that because it really wasn't enough work for one magazine. Those are the those are the heady days of IPC when we were all unionised and you couldn't fire us. You know, of course. If you tried. Okay. Um, <laughs> 
but uh, um, and I was I was on the um, I was on the whatever it was called committee. Um, I, I'd got into so much trouble at Fleetway that that the the union as soon as I got to be twenty one I couldn't be a I couldn't be a steward until I was twenty one. But I'd been in I'd been working for so long b before that because I started at sixteen that I was too young to join the union, but I'd got enough experience to be in the union. So it was a very strange situation. Because um, you had to have five years or something, four years experience. I can't remember what it was, but I, anyway, I wasn't, I was, wasn't 21. As soon as I was 21, I mean, I was, I was, I was, I was, I was pretty much Iron Man. Um, but uh, we, we worked on comics, we worked on, the, on, on Lion and Tiger. Yeah, Although, fantastic. I mean, I did, I, I did a lot of work for them. I didn't actually work. Yeah. I worked on the annuals. I did pretty much all of the annuals yeah. at that time because I was probably the only person who understood type. I mean, yeah. it's everybody else was used to working on comics. Yeah. Um, it wasn't. It wasn't. You know, they were inexperienced, but they just gave it to me because I knew how to sort of set up a line of type, um, or not set it up personally. I mean, we actually had printers for that who yeah. did that kind of work. We. Um, so you worked and, on the uh, anyway, on the tech yeah. stories in the annuals. Yeah, I, I, well, I, I did all of it, but I yeah. did it, I did I worked on the text mostly, and and also you couldn't work for your own paper. It was kind of oh, interesting. You weren't allowed to to work for your own paper, so we all worked for each other's papers. I mean, it's ridiculous. Yeah. We, you know, we, we we were sitting across from one another on desks. You know, how'd you like it? Well. You know, you could probably cut this bit out. Okay, fine, thanks. Can you put it on the pay sheet for next Wednesday? And that was it. I mean, we were—I was rolling in money at, at eighteen. It was horrible, really. Because <laughs> it was that, is that is that sort of typical thing at eighteen? You don't know what to spend it on. I mean, you haven't got a, you know, except you know, except booze and, yeah, and yeah. food and all, and ladies, all, all that boring so, stuff. So, you know, <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean. You didn't really come in. You, nothing else. You know, you didn't have a wife. You didn't have kids, and all the rest of it. You were, you were, you were behind. So I had a very good life at that time, writing comics because I could do, you know, I could do a, a day's work and and get very well paid in those days. Um, anyway, that 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 was that was sweet. Well, I, I really, I sort of enjoyed it, but I came in, I came into con into a conflict with the management. Oh, right. Over a number of things, they they couldn't fire me, and the guy trying to fire me actually burst into tears. I know this from the guy who was his superior, who didn't want to fire me because he was a friend of mine. Yeah. So, so, so it was just one of those things. It was a, it was a, it was a funny. It was a, it was a battle at the end with Fleetway. I mean, I was doing all kinds of stuff, putting up signs saying, "You know, help! I'm a prisoner in a word factory." And, <laughs> yeah, you know, okay. and then, yeah. Then the then then one of the directors would come around and take that sign down. And, take a sign down you know, and so on and it just went on like that but nobody could fire me it was wonderful i left in the end because of, <laughs> I mean, of the tension so 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 thank you for that detour into fleetway that's fascinating i think every, I'll, i know a lot of people who had a conflicted departure from that company um you know myself included so yeah. so uh, so it's back so back to uh, it's back to the genesis of elric um, so, you you creating those uh, those first uh, novelettes for Science Fantasy magazine, right? Yeah, T Ted Ted said, um, you know, we, we were across the road from Fleetway. I mean, there was uh, Andy Benson and Harry Harrison were the other two people in the pub. I remember it well, and we're just talking about it nostalgically. Really, we weren't really thinking of doing anything about it. And then Ted said, and I told Ted that I'd done this uh, Conan story, half a Conan story. He said, oh you know, maybe you could do something for me, you know, on science fantasy. And I said, sure, you know, I'll give it a go. And so, you know, five minutes later, I'm panting at his door with, with, with the manuscript. And, uh, and it went, I uh, decided that I didn't want to do a Conan story if I didn't have to do a Conan story, much as I liked Howard. Um, but I did, I, did, um, I did admire the form and I really admired Howard's writing. I mean, there are times when it just soars. I mean, it's extraordinary writing sometimes. If he was slightly better educated in the world, I mean, yeah. you know, he's so isolated, he probably would have, would have become an extremely good writer. This would all be sort of part of his glorious past, as it were. Yeah. So anyway, that, that, um, I, I, so I, I, you know, I'm, I love, I love Howard. Um, not so much Tolkien, who I could never get into. I mean, it's as simple as that. I mean, I, I don't want to get into sort of any arguments or anything because they're, they're tired and old. And there's people on 
on uh, YouTube still arguing about it, so I'll let them do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right on. Um, uh, yeah, anyway, I just, just wanted to do Elric as, as, as differently as possible, yeah. but still keep it within the form. I mean, I, I didn't want to lose the form. Um, and that's really my attitude in a lot of ways with, with science fiction, you know, that the form's good, it's a sturdy form, but you can do a lot more with it if you, if you know, if you, if you, so if you understand it, if you get into it. There's something in me, it's still there, that, that, that can't do what somebody's done before. Or if yeah. somebody's done it before, maybe you can do it another way. I don't mean better, but another way or something. Yeah. Or you can add to the, to the tools that are in the toolkit is really what it, what it boils down to. A lot of people were frightened of this at the time. They got, they got very agitated and started saying I was killing science fiction and so on. But nonetheless, um, this is not the genesis of Elric, sorry. Um, back to Elric. And so I, that's why I did Elric. I, I just wanted to do him as differently as I could. Um, I mean, if you've been doing Lion comic for, what, four years, three or four years, you kind of want to do something a bit different, I think. Yeah, no, of course. I, and, and from that point where, you know, you, you, create, you created Elric and then it got into that, you know, marvellous sequence of stories uh, and novellas. When, um, has the, has, did the success of Elric come as a surprise to you? Well, how did it all feel when it, when it really exploded? How, how, what was well, that like to be at the centre of that? Yeah, it was a surprise. I mean, I thought, I thought that story was the only story I was ever going to write in that mode for science fantasy. Yeah. I mean, I was going to write other stories, but no, no, no. Um, Ted came, came you know, Ted Carnell, the editor, um, he said they'd had a huge, um, which probably meant about 10 letters for them, but, they, but you know, they'd had a huge response um, on, on the Elric story, could I do another one? Now, I was a working writer. I mean, I'd, um, you know, I'd have done anything. I mean, I, I, I could have wound up in publicity if somebody had offered me a job of that kind, you know, whatever it was, as long as I was actually working from home. I mean, I didn't really want to work in an office. Um, so, uh, I, you know, I was, I was glad, you know, to me, it was, it was not particularly unnatural in that Fleetway was selling, you know, hundreds of thousands at that time. So we were kind of used to getting little blips, not necessarily um, a trend, but a blip. So for me, it was a blip um, until after I'd done three stories, I think it was a trend. Yeah, you know, yeah. you've got, you got the idea you were, you were actually doing something you liked. Um, being something of a crusader, because everything I do, I turn into some kind of bloody crusade, which I, I don't know why, but again, I do. Um, I thought, right, this is the right time to, you know, to tell people, you know, <laughs> I don't know. Um, what, you know what we can do with this form you know that's yeah. this, this sort of ridiculous um and uh and you know i was doing I, I i started to do new worlds actually around the time elric i thought was finished because science i hadn't got any book publications books at that time even tolkien were marginalized to a huge extent there was no cult of tolkien at all there were a lot of people like me who had a go at it, knew it was part of the canon, but didn't necessarily like it. I mean, you know, some did, some didn't. I was one of those who, who didn't get on with it, but I didn't get on with anything that was in that tone. Um, something I wanted to ask you about with regard to Elric is that, uh, okay, so, you know, you have, your, you have your, your huge, almost kind of snowballing success with Elric, which I, or I, it seems to me as a fan, you know, is is has almost had a kind of self perpetuating life of his own. You know, where he's 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 just become oh, this yeah. thing. I agree. That that's 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 it's bigger than you. You know, bigger than it, it's a fantastic achievement. What? How? Where did you first conceptualize the concept of when you created Jerry Cornelius, and then you, you well, came up with the Eternal Champion and the Multiverse? How did that all come together? It all came at once, really. The Eternal Champion, I, I started when I was 17 and probably didn't know how to finish it, because I never did finish it. I mean, it was, a, it was essentially a fragment. I think I, I published it in a fanzine, but you know, it's a fragment. Yeah. And uh, so I, I, um, 
I drew on that later when I actually, all of these stories, I know that it sounds terrible, it's not at all romantic and it's not at all exciting or, or you know, as, you, as you've described it. I was, I was married, I had a child in the first year of marriage, well I didn't, but as you know, my yeah. wife did, and then we had another one immediately, we didn't know an awful lot about birth control in those days, we had Dr. Spock and we had to steer by Dr. <laughs> yeah, Spock and that yeah. was it. <laughs> so, um, we, we did eventually learn about birth control. Well, it came in. I mean, it became legal to have birth control. So, you know, we had it as soon as we got the chance, about the same time we needed it. And uh, so I think of these stories all in terms of, of moments of need. When I was doing a story because you know, I needed to write a story because we had two kids that needed formula and, you know, all that. Um, I don't remember much else about that that time. I remember mostly my children. And I remember my children in association with ideas I had while I was taking them for a walk in the park. I mean, it's, it's a strange mixture. Um, I, I, you know, people have described me as a powerhouse and all of that. I mean, in the past when I was doing all this, I didn't think of myself as a powerhouse. I really just thought of myself as a working writer who needed to feed his family. Um, Certainly my, my wife, who's also a writer, was sacrificing a lot more than I was um, for that. So um, it was, it was um, you know, was, that's how I thought of it. I know it sounds sort of pious and, and dark, but that was simply it. Um, the imagination, my imagination was already fueled. I mean, it was fueled up by Edgar Rice Burroughs and Lee Brackett yeah. and Ray Bradbury and God knows, you know, the, the the writers I admired. Every, every one of those writers, even Burroughs, had a certain style, a certain tautness of style. Oh, in Lee's case, a very conscious style, yes. because she knew what she was doing. She, was, amazing. was, she was truly amazing, she, I think. She really bracket. was. Yeah. Um, and, and I mean, she was a very, very good friend. And, and we had our political views were completely different. I mean, you could probably, in these times, they might be on the same side. Yeah, right. <laughs> you know, okay. They, her standard was Theodore Roosevelt, you know, my standard was, was, was FDR, as it were. And uh, so we, you know, we, she, but, and they, they were just old fashioned Americans, decent old fashioned Americans, and their views were the views of the 30s, of old fashioned Americans in the 30s. So I didn't really feel they were threatening me in any way by having these views. When we put the Vietnam War thing in, um, in, in the press, we put some ads in the press, the SFWA did. Yeah. Um, she was on the pro side, I was on the against side. Yeah. That was Lee Brackett. I mean, but she was really solid. I mean, as a friend, as a, uh, as a writer, I mean, everything about it was great. And I think I probably learned more from Lee than anybody. Fascinating. I, I mean, that, that, that's so interesting to hear. I mean, I think the great thing about Lee Brackett is, so, well, like yourself, so versatile and, and, and crossed, you know, meant through many of the traditional boundaries for an author, did so many different things. Yeah, The and, Big Sleep. I mean, she wrote most, well, she never said so, but she did write most of The, the Big Sleep. Yeah. And it's her draft. Yeah. So that was precisely what I was thinking of, actually. Funnily enough, I watched The Big Sleep for, I don't know, the umpteenth time the other day. It, I, I, I got the Blu-ray. It's such a beautiful piece of work. It's such a perfectly realised film, mm, I think. Yeah. And um, you know, to go from that to go to 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 go and just if you look at the wealth of what she did. But again, that for me that has echoes in in your work with just the tremendous breadth of well, what you've done it's and the probably, influence she had of it. The same all. attitude, basically. It's the same attitude. I mean, I've known other writers like this, literary writers, genre writers. It's basically, um, you know, just a Puritan worth it, ethic yeah. or whatever it is. It's just you have to, you know, you have to feed yourself if you can. You know, and in spite of me being very pro-socialist, as it were, in, in, a, you know, in a lot of my ideas, I, I, I think in terms of the community. Um, but at the same time, that real sort of individuality, which you, you can't really make up, you can only you can only be born with it. It's just a question of sheer luck. And honestly, every 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 every, every minute of my life, as it were, I mean, I've got, I, that's not true. Um, I I I'm grateful for that. I know there's nothing else. You know, I took advantage of the luck, but which is, of course, you need a steady ego to be able to do that too. Yes. And I had a very good 
um, home life, but you know, my mother, I, you know, my shit didn't stink. You know, yeah, my mother yeah. was, was <laughs> um, and there's nothing like a, a a single mother to really, you know, really get you moving. And you know, you can do it <laughs> because she would want to do it if she could. You know, that's a, that's a lot of what's behind it. And uh, um, she was always she always hated my work. My mother, by the way, when oh, I really? first came out. <laughs> Absolutely disgusted. She oh, really? the across the room. Yeah, um, she actually threw the magazine across the room. She said, "Oh, Mike, I don't know where you get it from. It's not your father, and it's certainly not from me." Yeah. <laughs> and that was it. Um, but luckily, she gave me a strong enough ego not to be, you know, not to be worried by stuff like that. I just carried on, you know. Um, and uh, I should stay on topic. That was Elric. Sorry, I'm, I'm going to take up all of your so, day if I go on. Like, so, the rest of your day. Um, with, reg with regard to Elric, what was uh, have you, do you have any um, of all the many, of all the comics adaptations? Given the fact that you had a grounding in comics yourself, which have been your favourites? Um, well, Jim Cawthorne is my personal favourite because Jim and I pretty much came up with the character together. I mean, Jim, I talked about him. Jim drew him. You know, just sketches, just sketches. Um, and he, of course, did the first Elric comic. So I'm going to be, I'm, it's like a baby duck. You know, it's the first thing I saw. I'm always going to love that best, I think. Um, after that, I, I don't know. I mean, on, it's not the Elric comic so much as the Coram comic. I like Mignola's work a lot. Oh, he's fantastic. He is the best. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, on, on the Coram. And the, um, the Eternal Champion, how, how he's shaking. I mean, I did that because I, I said to how he look, stop, stop rushing jobs you know if i give you all the money for the comic will you not rush this job because he's such a good artist oh he's fantastic and yeah he's the best he is. and uh, and but he's a lazy butter he takes on too much work or whatever it is <laughs> you know, it's never quite it, or rather it never was quite you know what you knew he could do because you, you knew what he could do and uh, so that was the, that was the deal on that one with elric craig russell at first, I didn't like it very much. I've come to like it a lot. Um, I like Robert Gould. I mean, there's, there's a lot of, um, um, he's not, of course, in it, or at least not yet in the comic series. I don't know if he ever is going to be. It's a kind of, he did a, thank you, water. Um, very good. I'm gonna have some myself. <laughs> Cheers. Yes, I wish I had a glass. I only got a plastic bottle. Um, In some, I mean, in some ways, I've, there's so many Elrics. There are so many out there. They, they keep turning up all the time. Um, you know, people say oh, hesitantly, well, I did this Elric, you know, when I was at art school or something like that. And they're brilliant, some of them. Yeah. I mean, absolutely brilliant. So you get kind of uh, overwhelmed by art. And I've had probably all the good artists. I mean, I started in uh, Fleetway with Don Lawrence. We yeah. did his first color strip together. And that's the first time Don had ever used colour. I mean, it was beautiful colour. Carl the Viking in, in some annual. Yeah, of course. Cool. Right on. Um, yeah, it, that's great stuff. Yeah. I mean, uh, the reason Absolutely. I ask is, is my first introduction to, to Elric. I think, like a lot of comics fans who read a lot of comic books of a certain age, was um, that, uh, that, uh, that two-part appearance in Conan the Barbarian in the early oh, 70s yeah, yeah, with yeah. the Barry Windsor Smith yeah. art. And I, I think probably like a lot of people, I read that, I loved it. I actually loved it more than the, the actual Conan strip. And then I sought out the books as a result of that. And I'm sure that is a common that's thing. Good. I've spoken to quite a few guys yes, who are is. big Elric fans who that's the, that's the, that was their first exposure, if you will. Yeah, uh, and games. Games yeah. and, and uh, um, yeah, I mean, I, I'm grateful for that, obviously. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a great great thing but i've always i mean I, people were very snotty in the early days about about games and comics i mean they really were people you know oh, yeah, I, I, I don't have anything to do with it but luckily of course i'd been down in the mud with the with the blokes i knew, I knew, I knew actually what, what, what they could do um so so i had no no problems with that at all um and with games the same thing i just i just you know i just let's do it lads. you know whatever you're doing it's fine so i i really I didn't give any instructions or anything to any people doing anything. Um, I just looked at what they did and saw the possibilities of yeah. it, I think, or, or you know, how good it was. 
Um, but I still come back to Mignola. I'm afraid it's. Um, uh, Mignola is fantastic. He is so good, yeah, though. He, he, yeah, I, I, yeah. I mean, I think that's. I think that's. Uh, I think that's an excellent. Um, I, I think he's an excellent person to jump on. He's just such a superior talent. But but I also I also what I find so fascinating about your career is what you've just touched upon is the the degree to which you've gone out there and explored the concept of the shared universe and you've embraced music you've embraced games you know you you were really you know uh somebody who was kind of synergistic and cross-discipline before anybody even used those terms within within popular culture you're kind of way ahead of your time really you know and and uh, that must be kind of gratifying to look upon the world of popular culture and, and kind of entertainment and to see so many people have taken your lead and taken that approach well it is it is and it isn't um i must say it is and it isn't i, I don't want to sound sour about that no i'm interested in the questions the, yeah. yeah um i'm not uh, in a lot of cases i feel that I've, I've created the tools to do the job yeah as it were people have ignored the tools and just gone for the surface so right. you know Warlord of the Air, in spite of being what it was, the, if you like, the first steampunk or one of the first yeah. two, or whatever, you know, however people place it in the history of such things, uh, it's, and all those narratives are artificial because they have to be, they're narratives. You know, to make up a narrative, you have to leave a lot of stuff out. In my case, I know that I was like that to other people. Of course, I was not like that to myself. People never are. All I was, was a, ever, was a working writer and a working musician. Hawkwind asked me, I've been, I'd done a lot of musical work in the past, um, but when I, had, I dropped it after I was married for the same reasons, it didn't make enough money, I couldn't make money at it. I had to, you know, I had a family. Um, but when Hawkwind invited me to do my own stuff on stage, which they called poetry and I called declamatory rhetoric, <laughs> which I must say... Which is a great term. Like that. Fantastic I, I, term. Yeah, yeah. Um, Linda hadn't been to a Hawkwind concert ever, so she didn't know what I was like. And we did a concert here with ex-Hawkwind members yeah. um, a year or two, March before last. And, uh, um, and so I did it, and she was with me because I was sick as a dog at that point. I'd had back surgery that didn't work, and I was really... Oh, right. you know, yeah, that's that's never fun. Yeah, <laughs> I, was, I was pretty pretty feeble, and I look at the photos of it now, and I'm just drawn, you know. But anyway, I, I did it all right, and I was happy to see the other blokes and all that. Linda hadn't heard Linda hadn't, Linda hadn't heard me perform before, in that way anyway, and she was really impressed by it. So, so I feel a lot better about it. The applause of the crowd, I've had pretty much all of my life, yeah. and I, you know, that's the, it's the same as any. Um, anybody in music it's the same thing you kind of you either get silly which i did at the point i must say i got completely out of my nut and uh, i ruined one marriage yeah. um completely as a result of that i mean i just you know i'm not saying i i was oblivious to it but i was aware of it and i was trying not to be like that not to follow kind of the you know the usual path into many marriages and womanizing yeah. and all that because i didn't want to i loved i really loved everybody yeah, time, yeah. You know, everybody in the, in the unit particularly my girls so i started doing stuff again and i, I started um uh playing guitar again i also had a banjo because as a kid i'd started Lovely. with a banjo it was a very cheap instrument and it was just all i had you know at the time so i had a six string banjo it, it was sort of sprung like a guitar but it, it, was, it was a banjo and uh so I'd, I'd, I'd done that, and I became the go-to banjo guy in 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 the Grove, you know, because I lived in the yeah. Grove, and uh, and Ireland was just around the corner, you know, and, and so on. So 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 I, I as I said at the time, at that period of time, if you didn't play a fretted instrument, you felt that you were somehow you know not not quite right in yourself, you know, because everybody did, and. Uh, you know, Virgin was round the corner. The whole thing was 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 really very lively, and uh, I did. I, I actually played banjo for um, for Eno. I'm probably the only that now that is players. that that is quite the credit to have. Used. That's fantastic. Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. mate. Yep. Yeah. And uh, the strings were flat. I said, "Oh, buddy, I'm going to have to put new strings." And he said, "No, no, leave it like that." <laughs> so you got 
it's a horrible flat flat um banjo but it, it, he liked it. it sounds all right to you. I, mean, yeah, I, 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 like I, I can't yeah. think of any other major author who has the the impeccable um uh, music. I used to be a music journalist, by the way, and uh, a, a movie journalist as well. But somebody like you, who crosses both of those planes, has the impeccable music credits that you've got because you wrote songs for the Blue Oyster Cult as well, didn't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I, the thing is, I became a bit of a cult myself at that point. Mm -hmm. This is probably why I went nuts. This yeah. is this is my hippie prince period, which I'm not proud of in many ways, although I'm proud of in many other ways. I, I um and almost everybody rock and roll person you met had read my books. Everybody had read yeah. my books. I mean everybody I think but Jimi Hendrix who hadn't yeah. probably read anything yeah. he didn't need to either. Yes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um I can't remember even I, anyway, you know, it was it was it was so I was in a in the same position of being able to move on the same plane as if you like, with the same experience because it's not it's not that you're feeling, you know, we're all we're all stars here. You know, you, you don't think like that at all. You think, phew, here's somebody, you know, who sort of knows the same kind of life that, 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 that and you know, yeah. and look the ins and outs of it, and probably, you know, likes to talk about an old Ian comedy or two too. It's, you know, that sort of thing. It's not. I don't. What I mean is that you just don't think, but you're glad to be in that sort of situation, obviously, yeah. um, because it gives you an entry everywhere, and and it was my luck to have an entry into almost every aspect of British society. Yeah. I mean, I'm not, so, I'm, I'm thinking back on this because I'm writing autobiography. I mean, I don't normally think like this. So Mike, um, we're, we're almost through our time and there are just some very quick questions I wanted to fire at you. Um, what, uh, what did you think of the, uh, what did you think of Elrod in Cerebus? Yeah. The, oh, I loved it. Yeah. Absolutely loved it. Yeah. I mean, it's superb. Um, I had every issue, you know, and Dave knew I liked it too. So um, um, he was a terrible old male chauvinist pig. It's very hard to oh. to, to like him. Uh, to, to oh, yeah. Die. I mean, yeah, these days he's in a very unique space, shall we say. That could he be, a, we could is. do a whole one of these hours on the, on the stuff that he believes. <laughs> um, yeah, I, yeah, I, yeah. I mean, I think in terms of appreciating his work, it's best just to think about that and, Talking about him, the human being, that's a whole other thing, right? Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> so what about... Um, so, you know, I, I, I haven't been in close contact with him. <laughs> that, well, that's, <laughs> uh, that's probably quite a heartening thing to hear. <laughs> 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 and um, and uh, is there, has, has there been any progress on the, uh, on the Elric movie? Because I know there was a flurry um, of activity about 10 years or so ago. In yes, that was, that was the, um, the, the Weiss brothers, who yes. were very nice and... Uh, and then they got tired of trying to get, um, I think it was Paramount, to make it. And uh, they went off and made that really not very good um, uh, Philip Pullman. Oh, yeah, The Golden Compass. Pullman. Yeah. Gold, Golden Compass, um, which was disappointing. So after that, I was rather pleased they, they couldn't get it together you know, to do it. And, and in a sense, I think they, they shot their fantasy, fantasy and that was over and they went on to other stuff because they'd started with American Pie, I think, um, which made a lot of money for the studio, which meant at the time they could do anything they wanted to do, um, but it didn't last. Can I ask, what, what's, your, uh, what's your feeling about, um, I, it seems to me that a lot of your concepts are to be readily found these days, particularly within the DC universe, the multiverse. What, yeah. what's, your, what's your relationship with that? How does that feel? It's not bad with DC, because DC paid me for some of that. Right. I did a okay. Bible for DC. Yeah. And I, don't, I think it's too complicated for DC, the Bible I did. It was basically the multiverse in, and how it sort of, and the map of the multiverse. Then I brought the characters in to fit, you know, because they wanted to blend magic characters with science characters as it were science heroes <laughs> whatever they used to be called superheroes alan is somebody though you've collaborated with you know a couple of yeah. i mean I, I, I one of my favorite comic books ever is um tom strong and i remember you oh, yeah. there was yeah. that uh yeah. the, the black blade blade of the barbary yeah. coast right <laughs> yes, yeah? yeah i thought <laughs> I, I, doing I thought that was captain <laughs> I zodiac think I got it quite right i don't think i got the characters quite right but i enjoyed doing the story yeah um and uh i, I you know i, I really enjoyed work uh, that was 
one of the few times I worked with with uh, with Alan. But Alan Alan uses other people's images, the icons, if you like, of the 20th century, in order to include their narratives into the into the story. He understands exactly what he's doing, and I understand exactly what I'm doing. When you when you mention a real person, that real person is not casually used as a mentioned Clinton on, on no. Endeavour last night or whatever. I mean, it's, it's sort of things that are just shoved in for, for the sake of it. They're, they're, you know, they're, they're thoroughly worked out. If you've got the figure there, if you've got a name there or a reference there, it's a story. It's another narrative. Um, and you assume that the reader has either read a lot of those narratives already, and so he's kind of, or she is going back to the, you know, the sort of reverberating in that way. Or you kind of have to point it out in so, sometimes. I mean, not not very much, and it's probably a tribute to one storytelling that uh, that people never get it. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, you know, you you Alan feels the same as I do. The story comes first. People are are reading you because they like your stories. Um, yeah before style, before anything else, before they even recognize why they're reading you. Sometimes it takes yeah. time. Um, they're not reading you because you're, you write better than most people. I know I write better than most people, but I know people who write better than me who can't get a, you know, can't, 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 can't get a story published. Yeah, can't so um, that's, yeah, I mean, it's, it's not to do with the writing, although, you know, I, I'm glad when people recognize I've done a bit of good writing. I did a column in the Spectator a couple of weeks ago, and and uh, I got a lot of praise for it, and I was really pleased. <laughs> yeah, oh, how cool, lovely! Good writing, and I mean, I'm, I know I've been told that a million times, but I've never believed it. I'm yeah. starting to believe it as uh, you know, as I advance towards my coffin. Um, <laughs> it's probably, I, I, I could have exploited it a lot better. Yeah. I look back and think, oh yeah, I could have made a lot of money there. But I've had that with Hawkwind too. I remember talking to Dave Brock in the days before he became a money-making machine, um, and, and both Dave, Dave said, you know, yeah, I said, well, am I right, Dave? We didn't go on television because you, we, we had to mime and we didn't want to mime. He said, yeah, it was stupid. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so he made, made a decision, <laughs> but, but it was, you know, it was one of those things. I think, I think in, in old age, Dave started to regret some of his generosity, but nonetheless, that was the nature of that band. It was a generous band of gen made up of generous people. You know? Yes. That's yeah. why sometimes the audience couldn't get in because all your friends were already in the audience. So yeah. that's what it was. It was so, so Dave got to, you know, got to um, argue a bit about that. I mean, you so, know, w once again, to, to be able to, uh, to be able to go from working for Fleetway to, and creating comics, to creating, like, creating those annuals, to creating these incredible universes you have, to having the music career you've had, to be so, you know, cross-cultural with all these different avenues to express your ideas. The thing I, I, I would like to say to you is, um, the thing that I know uh, for a fact, and everybody that I know who loves fantasy, which is 90% of the people I know, and everybody at Forbidden Planet knows, and everybody who shops at Forbidden Planet knows, is what a great writer you are. And it is a genuine pleasure and a privilege to talk to you. That's really kind of you. There's one, one customer at Forbidden Planet who, who uh, doesn't think that of me. Actually, two. Um, no, actually, three or four, come to think of it. It's me and members of my family. <laughs> oh, and your mum. Yes, of course. Yeah. And back in the day, I remember you said about your mother. <laughs> well, isn't that always the way? Isn't that always the way yeah. that, you know, you, you, yeah. you, that it's yourself and the people who are closest to you perhaps have a different take on things? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, I guess my, I, I mean, that's an eternal truth, right? Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing this hour with me. And I, I wonder oh. if, if you could, could one final question for you is in addition yeah. to your autobiography, right? Your biography, what else are you? Well, it's actually fiction. Sorry. Oh, uh, fascinating. It's, it's the Whispering Swarm sequel. The Whispering okay. Swarm had a completely or fairly fictitious early biography. Yeah. This one has it as honest as I can get, as straightforward as I can get reality, but then it goes into fantasy again. Sorry, so that's it. I'm okay. Very, very sorry. And, and so, so, so when, 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 will, when will that be with us? When do you think you're going to, when are we going to see well, that? Well, um, it's Elric's birthday next year. It's his 60th birthday next year. Um, and 
I'm writing, I've written most of a new Elric book. Um, really? Which will come out, yeah, which will come out, I suppose, next year, which, which I hope to get it out next year. I haven't got a publisher for it yet. Uh, I, I'm, uh, in England, I probably have, yeah. but uh, not, not here. Um, the problem is that I've written the book in the middle of that sequence. I'm supposed to be rewriting some of the second book. It's, it's, I, I would guess that publishers might stagger them, so I've no real idea when, when they'll bring them out. But I think there should be a fairly decent amount of mock-up product in, uh, in, in the shops for Christmas 2021. Fantastic. So, um, I mean, that, start queuing now, folks. Yeah. <laughs> so, well, <laughs> well, that will be an embarrassment to riches, and we will be there. We will be the selling and promoting those books for well, sure. So. Um, yeah, so, 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 Mike, w when when those projects are released, could you do me a favour? Could you come back and talk to us again? You know, and we're yeah. around the release of the books. So we'd love to. Uh, we'd love to get into some more detail about those projects. I mean, a new Elric book is something that people will be queuing around the block for. So we'd love to talk to you in some more detail yeah. about that nearer yeah, the time. Gladly, yes. Yeah, well, I'll be, I'll probably be in um, a really good mood then because it'll be after my back at last. Of course, <laughs> of course. That makes moment, complete sense. Um, it, it, this is one thing about, you know, people really liking your stuff. You really feel you've got to produce the next one, you know, do something a bit different in it or, you know, or they say, oh, that's it, the old bug has gone, you know, he's had it. But, uh, yeah. <laughs> hey, well, so you never know, this might be the one. Well, I mean, fingers crossed, I'm really hoping that's not the case. <laughs> <Me too>. uh, <laughs> <laughs> Mike, thank you so much for spending this hour with me. And thanks so much to Linda for setting it up with us. I, I, yes. I really do appreciate it. And uh, I'm looking forward to speaking to you again in the future. I can't wait for that. I can't wait for those new projects to come out. And, yeah. uh, well, we'll probably be in exactly the same pro exactly the same circumstances oh, I next year as we are this year. I have absolutely no doubt that you are one hundred percent correct about that. I'm I'm sure that's the case. <laughs> I'm sure that is true. Yeah, for sure. Again, the masks are going to get better. The masks <laughs> are going to get. You know, first of all, they're going to going to start going over here. Then they start going up here. Right. And then anybody with a mask gets burnt to death. So it's a nasty feeling wondering where this is all going, you know? <laughs> yeah. No, no, we're good, I fear. And I think the thing to do yeah. is remain happy on the outside and crying yes, on the remain inside. Remain calm and carry on. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and and, on, and yeah. on that, on that inspirational note, uh, this has been Forbidden Planet 42 with the man, the myth, the legend, that is Michael Moorcock. Thanks so much for spending time with us, mate. It's been great talking to you. I've enjoyed it a lot. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you. Mike. All the See very best again. to you, See. mate. Take care. Yeah. Cheers. Cheers.